First, I'd like to invite Sandra to kick us off with her presentation. Hi, everyone. I thought uh, I want to talk to you about uh, young people taking the road less traveled. And uh, because of the disruptions happening around the world, um, I want to tell you about three people specifically that the Straits Times did profile uh, sometime last year, uh, quite recently. Okay, let me start with Hua Mei Jun. Uh, as you can see, she is working in a furniture factory in uh, Jurong. Would you believe she's from Nanyang Girls High and Hua Chong Institution? both top schools that offer the integrated program. Now, you must wonder, how did she end up working in a furniture factory, hauling huge planks of wood and operating really complicated, dangerous-looking machines? When she finished her A-levels, unlike her friends who were thinking about, oh, should I choose between law and medicine? Uh, should I st study in NUS or NTU or head overseas? to a top university, May June was wondering whether she should even go to university. Mind you, her A-level results were good enough for her to go to university locally. But the problem was she didn't know what is it that she wanted to do. She really didn't know what would hold her interest for three or four years. So the very brave girl, I would say, uh, decided to buck the trend and decided she'll take a year or two off to figure out what is it really that she would want to do in university. So meanwhile, after speaking to her parents, who were naturally freaked out, as most parents will be these days, she looked at what is it she should do while she tries to figure out what is it that she wants to do. She decided to look up some causes that she may take up during this course of one year or two years. She's always been interested in uh, design and uh, working with wood, crafting wood. So she decided, OK, uh, I'll go and take up a course on furniture craftsmanship. And there was one that was being offered by the Singapore Industries, uh, Furniture Industries Institute. It's an apprenticeship program where she has to go and work in a furniture factory and in the afternoon or evening, take up lessons on uh, crafting furniture. So uh, she went to, went to work in this factory in Jurong and took up classes. This went on for a whole year. Fast forward, 18 months later, she has figured out some things about herself. First, she's very good at operating machines. Uh, partly because she's fascinated with what machines can do, right? She's also fascinated with the whole design process. Like, why does a table have to be a certain height? Why does a study desk have to be a certain height, different height from, say, a dining table, for example? So, she's now kind of figured out what is it that she's good at and what she wants to learn and she's heading to university and she's hoping to take up a course combining engineering with design thinking. So she's, she's one good example of a young person taking a path less traveled. Second person I want to talk about is Viren Shetty. Viren was studying applied maths in NTU. He actually quit his uh, course and decided to do a startup called Plus Margin. Now, Plus Margin is a platform that, uh, a software actually, uh, that helps businesses figure out how they can turn people browsing on their online shopping website into actual buys, you know, people who actually go on to buy their products. Viren is behind the, uh, the, the software. Would you believe that Viren, uh, when he was in JC, because his GP teacher, looking at his handwriting, uh, thought that he ought to go and test himself uh, for dyslexia. Uh, and uh, he, he went for the test and uh, discovered that he had both dyslexia and attention deficit disorder. But 
uh, thankfully in a mild form. But after today, he's still on medication uh, so that he can focus better. When he was doing national service, uh, that's when he got into the idea of doing a startup because his colleague, he was a clerk, he served as a clerk in national service. Uh, he was bored, and his colleague uh, next to him was doing a startup, and that got him inspired, and he started thinking up of his own ideas, and he thought of coming up with some kind of a software that would help businesses predict how uh, the, the consumer behavior on online shopping websites. When he decided to quit, uh, his course at NTU, he had to explain to his parents, right, that he wanted to go on to do this startup. And one of the things was, his parents said, okay, six months, we give you six months. And he said, okay, I'll take the six months, but trust me, it's going to take me a little bit longer to build this idea. But to him, it was important to seize the moment. And what was more valuable to him was really uh, learning in the real world as opposed to uh, learning applied maths in a university uh, environment. So, Viren uh, made it to the Forbes 30 under 30 uh, list last year. He's doing very well in, in uh, the startup environment. Another person is Go Wei Xiang, um, who in a way disrupted his own education pathways as well. He was in, a, uh, in ACS, uh, again, a, a top school, uh, difficult to get into uh, school. And then he decided, instead of going on to do his A-levels uh, and junior college, he decided to go to the Polytechnic because he was interested in nautical studies. It's a course that his dad took up in the 1970s. And uh, he, he was very much influenced by his dad. And uh, so, you know, again, uh, going from a top school, uh, which will probably lead him to the university, he decided to go to the Polytechnic. Did well in the Polytechnic, but again, instead of going to university, the usual path that most poly students or uh, students who do well would take, he decided, no, I, I think I'll learn more uh, by going out there to work. He joined an apprenticeship program offered by a company called Trafigura, a commodities broking firm and logistics firm. And uh, last year, he was the first non-degree holder to make it to their graduate program, which admits top graduates from universities around the world. So here again is another example of someone who took the path less traveled. Um, I'm telling you these stories because like Oswald, you'll hear from him later on, there are a lot of young people who do actually uh, want to go out of the traditional route. Increasingly, we're seeing a growing number of them who have their own ideas of what is it that they want to do, uh, what they think they're good at, but there are a lot of young people who are also just taking the path that they think will lead to good jobs, high earnings, you know, later on finding out that it's not quite what they want. As an education uh, journalist, I see this, for example, when it comes to, in Singapore at least, between choosing uh, between a junior college or polytechnic, it just happened. And uh, what you have is um, a lot of kids going on a junior college route because it's seen to be the more prestigious route. It will lead to a university place more easily rather than taking the polytechnic route, which might be, suit them better, which suits their interests and aptitude because their parents want them to go on the junior college route. So every year, do you believe there are between 400 and 500 students who switch from a junior college to the polytechnic route after finishing one or two years in a junior college. And then they figure out, oh, this is not really for me. I should be going to a polytechnic, and that's what I really want to do. Uh, this is something that I feel parents need to think about, right? I think there needs to be a change in mindsets. And we also have to think about how can institutions respond to the changing aspirations of young people.
uh, and the ideas of what they want to do. And with regards to universities, for example, uh, why is there a need to front load four years of education? Is there a way to change that? Do you need to do four years of degree studies from the start? Can you, for example, do one year, and then if you want to go and do a startup like Viren, can he go off and do that, and then perhaps come back? Can you imagine how much more he'll gain from a university course if he comes back from an experience like that? Or someone like Mei Jun, one of her worries of the, her parents had was that she'll lose out on a university place later on because she may be stuck with the more mature learners. She's not one of the fresh school leavers. But why can't she take a gap year? Isn't it more important that she figures out what is it that she really wants to do? She'll gain so much more from her university experience after that. Yeah? So I'll leave you now to Oswald. Uh, He's a guy who, who, who took the path less traveled. Uh, uh, he actually spent, what, five months in Berkeley before he decided to quit uh, to, to start uh, his, his company called Glintz. Oswald? All right. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Oswald. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Oswald from Glintz. Well, first, first of all, good morning. I think it's been a very good forum this morning. I've learned so much as well. So, the next five to 10 minutes, I'll just share a little bit about my experiences of taking the path less traveled. And also, I think what all of us here can do to help with this, this wave of education disruption. Everyone here. So to start off, I'll share how I got started on this path. Uh, I was actually about four or five years ago, and my friends and I were one year into army, and I was just having, a, I was about 18, 19 years old then, I was just having a chat with Ben earlier about how the ages of 18 to 25 are the most critical and important stages of a person's development. We get to absorb more knowledge, more information. And one year into army, my, my two friends and I were so bored of just shooting guns and throwing grenades because we wanted to learn more things. <laughs> so on the weekends, we did something else. We decided to start a t-shirt company, the online t-shirt company. We wanted to sell some shirts to our friends and, and all of those. So we did that, did some customer research, a lot of online research, and we built a website. And after a few months of doing that, somehow some journalists heard about us, which was great, and she decided to feature us on the news. So after a short interview, it was the first time, uh, I remember that morning we woke up, and then we saw our three faces on the newspapers, with the Straits Times, half-page feature. We're very happy, our egos were tickled. <laughs> oh, look, mom, dad, first time on the newspaper. Very happy. Uh, but on the exact same afternoon, I received a call from the military police. <laughs> <laughs> Oswald, what are you doing? The, we're gonna throw you into we may throw you into military prison, detention barracks, because this is considered moonlighting. You're not supposed to be starting businesses while you're serving the army. <laughs> so my two friends and I were scared out of our wits because I've heard terrible, terrible things about what goes on in the detention barracks. I heard it's worse than in like conventional prisons. It's, it's pretty harsher. And I haven't even gone to college. I haven't done, done anything. I didn't want to spend some time in military prison. So it was a very anxious few weeks. Uh, I had to go through investigations. We're talking to the military police. Weeks and weeks and weeks, and I remember going into the basement of Mindef. I was, I was actually working at Mindef at that point of time, and they just caught me down one afternoon and spent hours talking to the investigation officer. Uh, it was only a few weeks after that when they realized that, hey, the definition of moonlighting is making an illicit income. And like most startups, <laughs> we're pre-revenue. <laughs> <laughs> so zero dollars in revenue, we got off the hook. <laughs> they couldn't charge us for making an illicit loss. <laughs> so like, you're wasting all time, man. <laughs> few weeks. <laughs> what were you guys doing? How did you guys even get featured? <laughs> so, so after that, uh, we got off the hook. Uh, we quietly continued the business. <laughs> and then the next year, and, and that was how we got started on, on this path, just having that spare time. Uh, fast forward to a few months after that, we finally completed ARMY and we could legally do our business. Uh, we actually had about eight months gap, gap, time, gap time before we were supposed to go to college. 
So we took part in this program called JFDI, uh, Joyful Frog Digital Incubator. It was like a three months boot camp. They call it a car wash for entrepreneurs, where you go in not knowing anything about business, no experiences. You're supposed to pop out the end, all investment ready, all shiny uh, for investors to invest in. Uh, somehow it worked for us because at the end of that, we managed to raise some money for the business. We started with a half million dollars from some VCs. And then we were faced with a crossroad decision as to whether or not to go to college or continue the startup with this half a million dollars in the bank. Uh, so three 19-year-old, 20-year-olds, very ambitious. We thought we could do both. <laughs> so we did both. Uh, the pitches were go to university. So I went to, college, I went to Berkeley. My partners went to Warren and Stanford, and we said we'll penetrate the colleges from within because our users were, were students anyway. We'll, we'll expand from within. The investors believed us. So we're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. So we tried that for three months or so, uh, and, and it was a terrible idea. <laughs> My grades weren't going anywhere. The business weren't going anywhere. And that's where I decided that, hey, I spent three months in Singapore at the, in the accelerator program doing a learning businesses. And I spent three months, three to four months at Berkeley, which is supposedly one of the best schools. And I think it's, it still is one of the best business school at Haas. But the amount that I learned doing my own stuff, learning from real mentors and investors, and the three months that I learned in the lecture rooms, it was such a huge gap that I knew I had to take time off from school and focus on the business. Because even if the business doesn't work out, the amount of knowledge I would get and the experiences would be so much more valuable. And this is where I decided to drop out from school, came back to Singapore and focus on the business. And the funny thing happened was, uh, I think it was Shrey's Times actually, <laughs> they actually called us. It was, it was a term I was very proud of. Singaporean's parents' worst nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chinese New Year was very awkward. They, hey, why are you back after three months? <laughs> I was in in college. Um, but it's, uh, it's been about three, two to three years since. We've managed to raise about $3 million from some of the very, very best investors. And most, we've learned a lot. And most importantly, we have had the chance to impact about 300,000 users, young students on the platform, connect them to about 10,000 employees. And it's been a great journey. So I would say the nightmare, the worst nightmare, has turned out to be a pretty sweet dream so far. And I think the, the message that I would like to share my experiences is with, with all of us, with all of you here, and I think what we can all do to help impact this, this disruption of education is to, enable and to, is to enable and also encourage more people to take such alternative paths. Whether it's your niece or your child asking you for a gap year or some time away from school, or if you're part of an institution just designing that, that into the system or starting another university, I think we can all do something. So we're just encouraging this alternative path. I have a secret to share. Actually, I didn't drop out from school because when I, was, when, when I wanted to take some time away from Berkeley, I was very lucky. I called, my, I called Berkeley up. Uh, I went to the school and they said, great, you can come back anytime. You can come back when you are 90, 80, whatever. So I always <laughs> joke with my friends. My, my plan for doing that is so, my plan for dropping out, my reason for dropping out is so that two years later I can go back and party with a grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing was I could only go to Berkeley because of SIM scholarship. Um, SIM gave me a scholarship. My, my parents couldn't afford the half a million dollars in tuition fee, of course. And so SIM gave me a scholarship. And when I called SIM up, SIM up they said, we will give you one year or however long you need to, to work on a business. And if it doesn't work out, you can still go back to school. And there was that thing that enabled me to completely cover my downside and enabled me to take the lead. So, and also my parents were supportive as well. Um, so I think all of us here can do something to promote and also enable such alternative paths because then more and more people can, can take and forge their own paths and we don't just have to, to limit ourselves to the traditional mindsets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, this time we're going to mix things up a bit. So we're actually going to take the questions that, we ha that some of you have already sent to us. And uh, I'm going to pose two questions to Oswald first. And the first one is, 
um, can entrepreneurship be taught, do you think? Because Singapore has one of the best education systems in the world, but we seem to be languishing in entrepreneurship. Mm. Exceptions like you, uh, <laughs> apart from exceptions like you. And the second question is, in our workplace, we are already practicing fail fast, fail often. Why isn't the education system encouraging that? Um, so the first question is whether entrepreneurship can be taught. I think yes, it can be taught because because I, I think entrepreneurs are not just born. There are a lot of entrepreneurs are made. I wasn't born an entrepreneur. And I managed to learn entrepreneurship from my mentors, from my investors, from the boot camp that I went to. But I think when a lot of people think about teaching entrepreneurship, maybe they're thinking about in the lecture room context. And I, I think that's not, it's definitely not the, yes, entrepreneurship can be taught, but you definitely can learn it in school. Uh, I may be biased because of my own experiences of dropping out, but I think, the best way to, to sort of promote entrepreneurship is just exposing them to these opportunities and these alternative paths, and then hooking them up to the right industry mentors. Because thinking back from my own experiences when I was in junior college, I was in high school, I was always interested in business. I knew that one day I wanted to start my own business. But back then, my only concept of, of that business path was either I would take up a scholarship with, with the more business-oriented government organizations like IE Singapore, International mm -hmm. Enterprise, or EDD, because then that's where I get to do some business. Or I would go work at an investment bank and earn a lot of money and then use that savings to start my own business when I'm 30 or something. Because I didn't know about VCs. I didn't know about tech entrepreneurship. I didn't know about these paths. So, and I wish I had, I, I did start it earlier. So I think, one great thing that a lot of institutions can do is just exposing more students to such paths. We don't all have to teach entrepreneurship in lecture rooms. I think just exposing them to what's possible, the different paths that they can take, it's, it's a great opportunity in itself. So exposure rather than teaching. Yeah, I, I, uh, can I just add to that uh, very quickly? Um, you look at uh, National University of Singapore, they have an overseas college program. I agree with Oswald, it's about exposure and giving them the opportunities, just throwing them in an environment where there's lots of innovation, where there's entrepreneurship, uh, where they can just ex get excited about the kind of ideas that are being exchanged uh, between different people. So. Going to Silicon Valley, for example, is a very powerful experience for a lot of young people. And uh, I've seen young people being transformed, coming back, buzzing with ideas and ready to go. Thank mm. you. Okay. Uh, please keep your questions coming. If you have questions, you can come to the mics as well, okay? Um, in the meantime, we have another two questions which I'm going to pose to two of you. Uh, the first is, is Singapore education ready to be disrupted? And the second, I guess, is, is kind of linked to it. It's about millennials and how uh, millennials often seem very impatient. They have shorter attention span as compared to earlier generations. Um, and you know, how, how can the education system respond and try to engage these students? I am encouraged by some of the changes happening in our education system. Um, but I do think that <clears throat> we are a bit slow sometimes, and I think one of the things, I've written about it before, I'll say it here, despite the minister not being here, uh, I think one of the things that has to go is the primary school leaving examination. We are just too exam-focused um, to want to think out of the box, because uh, what you have is kids always wanting to conform and ensure that they come up top of the, uh, the class and top of the cohort. Uh, and our whole system rewards kids who do well academically. We don't encourage uh, a talent meritocracy. So that's one of the problems that we have. Mm. I think regarding the point of millennials, yes. and I will speak up for my generation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I recently read this, read this quote, uh, this, this, piece of, this piece of learning, which is, uh, there was this interview or this feature about the, the older generation, so yes. they say about what they think about this, gener about this younger generation, and what they say was, oh, they're so entitled, I've never seen people who are so impatient, um, things like that. The interesting thing was that this interview, this feature, actually happened in the 1900s. 
<laughs> uh, I think it was like 19, it was more than 100 years ago. So I think every generation mm. <laughs> is not much it's different. different. It's, it's, yeah. it's the same, right? Um, and I think how we can best work with the millennials, it's, it's no too different from how maybe the previous generations have worked with us, which is by mentoring them, by exposing them to different opportunities, and by being patient. Right. Yeah. How can education systems respond, right? Um, universities, for example, uh, let me give you an example. Stanford did a, a, a project called Stanford 2025, where they tried to look into the future to imagine what uh, Stanford undergraduate education should be like. And one of the things they came up with, do you need students to do four years at the outright after finishing high school? No, right? So they came up with this idea of a loop, open loop university system, where you can go to Stanford, you're admitted for, say, six years, right? You're given six years. And you, you do two years to begin with, and then you may decide to go and do a startup, you may decide to go and learn something else, go and work in a furniture factory like May June, for example. Um, and then you come back when you feel that you want to, you've gained some experiences and uh, it suits you to go back to class to learn a new skill uh, or you've developed a whole new area of interest and you want to go back and change the, the trajectory that you are on, take up a different major. So this goes on. So you go in and you, you know, come out and uh, add to your experiences, add to uh, the skills that you can learn from the outside, and then go back to university when you think that suits you. Uh, so Stanford is thinking of that, uh, this so-called open loop uh, university degree. Um, the other thing is that they are considering when kids come into university, instead of declaring a major, declare your purpose or mission. Imagine how powerful that will be when you say, uh, instead of saying, oh, I, I want to study law, imagine if you say, oh, I want to become a lawyer who fights for the rights of uh, immigrants, for example, right? Uh, how much more powerful that would be? And the university will help you reach that mission that, that you have uh, set out for yourself. So these are some of the things I've, I feel in which uh, higher education institutions can respond to young people with very diverse interests and aspirations. Thank you, Sandra. We have a question, ma'am. Yes, good afternoon. I'm uh, Paolo Barvian, the ambassador of Finland here in Singapore. Last week, I had the honor of hosting your Minister of Higher Education and uh, Skills Future, Mr. Ong Ye Kung, in Finland and he with his high-level delegation from your universities came exactly to look at how Finland uh, is doing the entrepreneurship training in the universities. We have 15 universities and uh, 25 universities of applied sciences. And uh, just during the le maybe last five to 10 years, all of these have started to have these startup incubators in them, inside the universities. And it's really like this entrepreneurship is something that, you know, it's come grounds up. It's come from the needs of people like, like, like Owen, <laughs> who, who really want to, to be part of the entrepreneurial uh, sort of uh, ecosystem and, and, and create it from their own needs. And they are very international as well, you know. They had in all these uh, startup uh, hubs they had and incubators, they had like very international teams of, of interns and students coming from all over the world. So we met some Singaporeans as well. Mm -hmm. So, but this was the question that, that uh, your minister wanted to look at how we've been, been doing it and how we've been making possible and how, be, how we've been sort of uh, given the passion uh, for the students to actually like pursue their, 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 their careers uh, many different ways. And, and also like combining always work experience and studies and, and getting the professors as well to mingle in the entrepreneurship uh, pattern and, and, and learning together. So it was really something that maybe also is coming this way if you continue pushing. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, Ambassador. Are there any other questions from the floor? Uh, if not, actually, I, I wanted to get your views on uh, this whole notion of career discovery. Mm. 
I mean, what is your sense of how we are doing in the area of career discovery in, in right. Singapore? So, career discovery. Um, so, we talked to a lot of young people, a lot of millennials, when we first started the platform. And the biggest few problems that we, that we saw, the pain points, was firstly, um, I don't know what I want to do when I first graduate, or even if I know what I want, I don't know what kind of skill sets I need. And even if I know what kind of skill sets, how do I get these skill sets? So it's where do I go in my career, what kind of skills do I need, and how do I get these skills? Um, so we built Glint's as a career discovery platform to help more young people discover different career paths and opportunities, identifying what kind of skills they need, and then connecting them to real-world opportunities like internships, projects, micro-learning um, courses to acquire these skills. Yeah. Um, mm. I, th I think one of the things that universities can do really is uh, to make transparent the kind of skills that students are actually acquiring through the courses that they are taking up. Um, I really see myself, uh, I mean, I, I, I see education itself really as a self-discovery process, right from preschool to university. It's all about helping a young person discover more about themselves, what their likes and dislikes are, um, where their real talents lie, um, and really the institutions and schools should be focused on helping that young person figure this out about themselves. So really, education is about self-discovery at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Actually, we have a question uh, that was sent to us uh, asking if uh, Sandra and Oswald could discuss how the less academically inclined can benefit from disruption in education, um, especially those who may not have the luxury of choices. Like, for example, you had quite a few choices. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I, I like the fact that our education system in Singapore uh, has become a lot more diverse and offers different choices uh, to young people. I also see a lot uh, more bridges and ladders uh, where young people... I mean, I gave you the example of uh, 400 to 500 students being able to switch from junior college to polytechnic. Uh, previously, you know, you wouldn't have that. You'll be kind of locked into a route, really. Um, but now, um, the, the education ministry um, allows them to switch, uh, even after they have completed their A-levels, to go on to do a polytechnic uh, course, um, what I would call a second bite of the cherry at one time, right? Uh, and uh, we, we should have a more open system like that that allows for this because some people just need a little bit more time to figure out what is it that they really, really want to do and what they're good at. Oswald, do you think disruption can help less academically inclined yes. students? Uh, how disruption can help yeah. less academically inclined, definitely. So I remember I had two friends back in high school. Uh, one of them, his name was Jipin, and he was a very talented pianist. Extremely talented. I, at, at like 14 years old, he was having his own mini concerts. I would go and support and so talented. But he was, because of his passion in, in piano and music, he was doing very, very badly in school, even though he was very smart. I think he scored higher than me in PSLE actually. So he, he's a smart guy. <laughs> but he, he just didn't like to study anymore because his passion was in music. And after one year of that, after two years of that in high school, he always had this tension between mm. music, do I, do I play the piano at home for 10 hours or should I prepare for my test? And because of his passion, he always chose the piano. After a while, he, he kept failing his test. And, and the school couldn't really understand that. Yes. Why were you not doing well? Why are you failing? And after a while, he dropped out of high school at 15 to pursue his music. So that's one case. And... We had another friend who had a similar interest. Uh, it was not in music, it was in photography. Um, similar experience of being very passionate about photography. He was spending all of his time, he would be at every school event, he's the designated photographer, but he was doing terribly in his school. Um, he got retained, and then after a while, he just felt like, this is not a place for me, and he dropped out of JC. So I, I always, uh, they're both doing quite well now. I think now they have a stable career. One of them, the pianist, is running his own his own like, music school. 
you know, but I've always wondered what if they had been given the support uh, and the understanding from the mm -hmm. traditional education system about their passion and given the right resources, what else could they have achieved and could they have achieved it faster? And I think definitely if, if they had received more understanding, more support, rather than just forcing them to study the traditional curriculum, I think they would have benefited tremendously. Yeah, and I've, I hope that that's one thing we can do for all future generations. Thank you. Okay, we have um, quite a few questions. Okay, uh, gentlemen first, and then there's two ladies over here. We'll just take all the questions together, and Sandra and Oswald can respond to all of you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Sean. I'm a SIM alumni from UB. Just a question for the uh, panel. I notice there's been a lot of discussion on, uh, you know, millennials, people who have just graduated, degrees for fresh graduates. But how about the adult learner? So for I went through the old school education system in Singapore. I memorized a lot of my uh, Chinese closed passages and things like that. Uh, I internalized a lot of those things. And when I tried to do a gap year, my mom said, you have been a liability for the longest time. I don't think you should continue <laughs> to be that liability. You should start being an asset. So I did not have a lot of choices. Uh, so that's, I think that's more on the parent side. So what is your advice for adult learners, who so people who are maybe in the 30s, who say that, hey, I've gone through this route of learning. It was a lot of the memorization. How do I unlearn all these things and start opening my mind to be competitive, to learn, or like Ben said, to break down the smaller bite-sized pieces. So we, are, we come from a lot that say, hey, did we get the short end of the stick because we kind of did well in school, but everything we kind of studied isn't relevant anymore to a certain extent. So what's your comment on that? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sean. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Shu Hui, and I'm a final year student at SIM, University at Buffalo. So here we are talking about the paths less traveled. So I would like to ask for students who are currently in the university route, like the traditional university route, how can students ourselves take the initiative to discover our passions and also explore paths less, less traveled while still in the university route itself, instead of waiting for institutional changes, which may take quite a long time as well? Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, uh, my name is Ketki. I'm a student of UB as well. Hello. Okay. Um, you are a startup yourself and a dropout, but uh, what made you think or inclined you to risking having no degree, but yet going on with the idea of startup? Because you know that, um, okay, I might not get a degree, so I might not get a job because you need to show a degree to get a job. So, like, what were you thinking when you, you know, put forward that risk? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Oh, okay, okay. One last question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, hi, my name is Eric. Um, I speak as a parent. So my question to the panel, Sandra and Oswald, if you were to set up a lifelong learning university, what kind of skills and knowledge would you like to offer to the young people? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, mm. You want to have a go? Sure. Well, um, adult learners, maybe I will education. respond yes. to the question on Risk. what kind of skills and I think that's also related to a previous question on what adults can do mm. yeah. um, potentially. So over the past two years we have hired about, we have a team of about 40 people right now in the company and one of the things that I look out for, I've interviewed quite a few number of people right now and one of the, the first things that I look out for is the ability to learn. So learning to learn is so important. It's the first thing that I look out for right now. And it's also one of the best predictors of success how, that we're seeing within the company. Um, well, first of all, we look out for people. One of the questions that I always ask people is what is one piece of negative feedback that you have received? And then I will see how they, and I'll follow up with how do you feel about that? So I've seen people who maybe they'll start defending themselves or I've also seen people who I'm not aware of any, any negative feedback. That's, that's all. <laughs> um, that's, and, then I'll, and I've also seen those who respond to feedback very well. And I think just the ability to respond to feedback, to reflect on that, and then to learn quickly, and also maybe to unlearn some of the past things you've learned, it's so important. So just recognizing that. So I think the skill of learning to learn and unlearning, it's, it's one of the most important things that I would impart. I would want people to learn. Um, the second question on dropping out of college. Mm. Uh, so my, my secret, my big secret was actually, I didn't drop out. <laughs> the big secret was, um, the, my downside was actually completely covered. I, I could cover my downside because Berkeley gave me an unlimited runway to go back anytime. 
uh, and SIM gave me time to, to pursue that as well. I think a lot of people think entrepreneurs is taking about is entrepreneurs is all about taking blind risk and jumping into the fire. But I think it's not about that. It's really about mitigating your risk, uh, making sure that your count, your downside is covered at a certain point of time. And that's one part. Uh, the second part was, what if I didn't have a degree? Mm. Uh, I was very clear that what I wanted was to start my own business. Even if this business didn't work out, I was very clear that I would start another one. And I know customers don't look at degrees. So I know it was a lot more relevant for me to start my own business and learn the valuable skills and experiences through that than staying in school for four years and just getting that piece of paper. Okay, thank you, Sandro. What about yeah. uh, adult learners and what kind of lifelong yeah. university? <laughs> yes, um, well, someone asked a question about, um, you know, what, what if you're already in the working world? Uh, well, we have the Skills Future Movement, <laughs> right? And we have uh, universities like SUSS uh, that caters very well to uh, uh, working adults who want to go back and learn something new. Um, I, I think there are a lot more opportunities now, really, uh, to go back and uh, even if you want to learn something completely out of your field, you never know how useful that's going to come in uh, later on in your career or uh, to expand the role that you are playing uh, within your company, for example. Um, one of the things I want to bring up about dropping out of university and all that, I think one of the big disruptions that's coming is how employers, and I hope it will happen in Singapore as well, how employers are going to uh, recruit uh, their workers. Um, increasingly, in the US at least, uh, where I go and do some of these interviews, uh, I see employers are a lot more open to doing their own assessments on whether someone has the skills uh, to actually do the job that they want to hire the person for. Um, and uh, I don't know whether you've heard of companies like Triple Byte, where, where they give you assessments uh, where you can uh, sit and be certified for having particular skills. And that increasingly, there are employers who are hiring uh, people for even top positions based on some of these uh, certifications. So, I, and I think that really is going to mushroom quite a bit uh, because increasingly, employers also are getting fed up of skills mismatch. They hire someone and then, based on their degrees, and then find out that they can't really do the job that they want them to do. So, we will see uh, these alternative forms of assessment and uh, that's going to be a big disruption for universities. Right? And uh, I think we need that in Singapore uh, because we still uh, have a, a, a hiring system that's very much based on uh, qualifications. Everyone uses qualifications as a proxy for skills. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap up now. So, uh, just to take us back to what happened in the morning. Uh, earlier this morning, we kicked off with a session on breaking the mold, where you heard Christina from Finland and Ben Nelson, who's the founder of Minerva. And what I took from Christina's sharing, for example, was, uh, I mean, I called Ben a disruptor earlier, I think, uh, but I, I, I think that Finland is also a country that constantly thinks about how to disrupt its own education system because, you know, even though they've ranked well in PISA for many years, they are one of the most admired education systems in the world, they're constantly asking themselves, how can we do better? And, and the great thing is, uh, you know, this whole belief that it, sometimes you do less and let the children be children, it actually helps them to learn through play, to be creative and to think more critically, more intelligently about the world that they live in. And Ben, of course, I mean, he's uh, you know, one of the most talked about startups in, in the university scene in the world. I think that uh, the New York Times described his Minerva as affordable elitism. And <laughs> I don't know what he thinks about that, but he had many controversial points. And one of them was that, you know, maybe universities or even large organizations shouldn't try to innovate uh, because, you know, innovation rightly belongs to um, 
startups like his, and that maybe the best that, uh, well, SPH is also a large organization, yeah. <laughs> and maybe the best we can do is copy fast. Um, and uh, it, during the, the second session, we had Dr. Lee uh, from SIM and Professor Zukowski from the University of Buffalo. And I mean, they, they interrogated the whole notion of what a university uh, is and should be going forward and how we need to rethink, for example, uh, Dr. Lee talked about you know, being a curator and letting students actually customize, mix and match, because surely individuals are the best people to customize their educational uh, experiences for themselves. And Prof. Sukowski also talked about how we need to f uh, rethink how we teach uh, to meet the needs of the digital economy and also the needs of digital natives. Um, and including, he talked about how PhD programs also might need to be rethought. And uh, we, now we've just had the last session about paths less travel, which I found very, very inspiring uh, because you opened my eyes to many possibilities. Uh, and, um, and, and the fact that young people have the courage uh, and also the chances to seize the opportunities that have opened up. So I thank you all and uh, for all your questions as well. Uh, which has, uh, you know, contributed to the discussion. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Lydia.